I'll start by saying, uh, you know, for the for the last seventy years, uh, the primary uh, vehicle of of social mobility that Americans have offered their fellow citizens is access to college. Uh, we were the first in the world to uh, to embrace mass higher education uh, for Americans uh, in the middle of the 20th century, beginning with the GI Bill, Servicemen's Readjustment Act, 1944. Um, we invest a great deal of faith in the promise of college to create economic opportunity, create um, uh, better, more informed citizens, uh, and and you know and build democratic community. Uh, and no place cares more about uh, about the virtue of college than than universities and schools of education. Uh, and um, we made the nation made great progress in expanding access to higher education. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, only a third of uh, American adults in the workforce uh, enjoy the benefits of a four year college degree. And those benefits are very substantial uh, to the extent that a four-year diploma is a baseline requirement for, for most uh, stable, well-compensated career ladder jobs in the United States. Uh, uh, possession of a four-year college degree also uh, is related to longevity, uh, general health and well-being, uh, relational happiness. Uh, so there are reasons why uh, it, it is important uh, that, that college continue to be a goal, a policy goal in the United States. Uh, but it's also the case that um, the possession or non-possession of a four-year degree has become a very important dividing line in American life, uh, separating people, distinguishing people um, who can expect to have relatively long, healthy lives, well-compensated employment, um, and an embrace of social difference and diversity. Uh, uh, in contrast with those who do not possess a four-year college credential and face a great deal of what social scientists call precarity um, or uncertainty in all, all walks of life. Um, the fact of that divide was made vividly clear uh, to many Americans with the election of Donald Trump uh, in 2016. Uh, uh, Non-possession of a four-year college degree uh, was perhaps the most strong predictor of support for a Trump presidency. Uh, and as many of you heard and saw over the subsequent years, uh, you know, an increasing divide between uh, so-called uh, coastal well-educated uh, elites uh, and um, so-called common Americans who did not enjoy the, the same privileges or status um, that college uh, uh, degree holders held. Uh, so that was a major change um, in American cultural politics, and it has shifted the national conversation about how educational opportunity ought to be distributed. Um, are there other ways in which education can be provided equitably, accessibly, uh, and in ways that are economically and civically valuable that don't necessarily require possession of a four-year college degree? Something else I probably don't need to talk about is that $1.8 trillion in, in debt that Americans owe uh, on, on student loans, um, unfortunately, very often for degrees that they have not have failed to uh, attain. Uh, and so that's another sort of enormous uh, problem that confronts anyone who, who wants to equate possession of a four-year college degree uh, uh, you know, with, with economic opportunity. Um, and I'm going to make the heretical commitment to not use any PowerPoint slides here today, because uh, I want to be sure and just enjoy the conversation. The second thing that happened uh, in recent years uh, is that a whole host of organizations that aren't that aren't colleges, that never were colleges, that don't want to be colleges, are offering uh, academic cr uh, credentials of various sorts uh, to Americans, and and they're targeting the men and women for whom four-year college degrees have been elusive or not appealing. I just put in the chat um, one of the most prominent examples of this. This is Grow with Google, um, brought to us by our friends in Mountain View, um, who have who are, are very good at giving Americans gifts, if you hadn't noticed, um, giving us gifts that are that we find so beguiling that we find we can't live without them in a very short period of time. Uh, they are doing this with um, with academic uh, 
uh, credentials that are geared to enable adults to make occupational transitions. Um, Alphabet, Amazon, Microsoft are all conveying uh, portfolios of this sort. So, uh, you know, um, uh, alternative credentials are not are no longer just for the sort of Coursera's and boot camps of the world. They are increasingly being purveyed by some of the most powerful uh, corporations um, uh, that the world has ever seen. Uh, so those two uh, changes, the the Trump election and a recognition that a four year college degree can be a can be a, a, a dividing line in American life, not just a ladder. And the, the, the fact that more and more organizations that aren't schools are, uh, are, are providing credential opportunities to, to adults um, was the impetus for the work that I want to continue to talk briefly about here. Because here's the thing, when it comes to adult education that happens outside of conventional two and four year college uh, programs, the United States is flying blind. Um, if an organization does not receive Title IV funds under the federal government's Higher Education Act of 1965, they don't have to do any reporting about outcomes or student learning. Um, uh, so this proliferation of new uh, 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 forms of providers means that um, if we're thinking about policy and governance in this domain, uh, uh, there's essentially no information that's available to, to decision makers. Uh, so we, as, as policymakers or academics, uh, we don't have any way of identifying the value of particular kinds of credentials for particular groups of men and women. Um, we don't know the extent to which our theories of human learning that are substantially built on the study of children apply to people in midlife, right? Do people in midlife or late life, you know, learn in the same way? Do they apprise puzzles in the same way? Uh, do we need different kinds of, of, of cognitive and, and educational and learning theories to, to help adults learn? We don't know how to support, and we here meaning educators, um, we don't know how to support men and women who are making very dramatic life transitions um, as they seek to find new forms of learning opportunities. So we talk a lot, for example, at present about how the future of work is going to require people to pivot across occupations and careers. Well, you know, how to scaffold the transition of a trucker or a welder to becoming a home health aide or a data analyst, right? Um, how do we think about making educational opportunities appealing for people for whom education was never very appealing, right? The, the men and women who weren't able to finish high school or who finished high school and made it to college but didn't have a positive experience there. Uh, the, the men and women who feel alienated from academic campuses or feel like that those systems don't serve them very well. You know, if the nation is going to take seriously you know, creating new learning opportunities for adults to take advantage of over the course of their entire adult lives. We need a serious social science of educational transitions, of adult learning, um, um, uh, to, to, and basic information about what kinds of programs work for what kinds of men and women. That was the conviction that uh, brought me to convene with a bunch of people across the country. This event that I'm putting in the chat uh, that several people on the call helped a lot with, Olivia Crawford, uh, Ann Palmer, Jason Wilmot uh, know this work very well. Um, uh, this is a convening um, that was sponsored by the National Science Foundation. Um, we even have a paper version of the report. If you like paper, sometimes it's, sometimes it's kind of useful, right? It makes it feel real. Um, the National Science Foundation has a has a, and I'm only going to speak for a few more minutes, two two or three more minutes, so we have a good time to discuss. Um, has a has a modest grant program that enables people to enables the convening of conferences that are targeted with you know charting new research domains, um, and and these 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 funds are a sufficient to maybe bring two dozen people together at a Holiday Inn in Bethesda, Maryland for two days to eat bad bagels and, and look at each other's PowerPoint slides. Um, but because, uh, because we were doing this in a pandemic, um, uh, number one, and also because 
those who have expertise in adult education and lifelong learning are very rarely in research universities. Um, they typically are existing outside of research universities for reasons that we can talk discuss. Um, we decided to cast a very wide net and use use the affordances of of the of Zoom to cast a very wide net um, and invite essentially anyone who we thought might um, have some expertise in this domain. We sent out several hundred uh, invitations and got well over two hundred registrants. Um, we convened the session during two hour Wednesday morning events for over the month of July, so four July Wednesdays. And despite the fact that we were doing this on Zoom in July, uh, we had at, at least 150 people or, uh, show up at each of those sessions. And so, and we we structured this as a sort of distributed peer review of, you know, if the nation were to build capacity to support adults in lifelong learning, right? Uh, not necessarily in college, you know, what kind of scientific capacity uh, would we build um, if there were to be a new a new say agency of the National Science Foundation or the Institute for Education Sciences or the Department of Labor or the Department of Education um, and you know we came up with what I think is a fairly fairly crisp and I, I think I think usefully simple set of nine recommendations and I'll only mention three of them here and then we'll open it up for discussion and again you can find the snap the document online very easily. The first thing we argued is that we should think about the provision of education and lifelong learning in the United States primarily as a civic project, not as a scientific or technical project, right? So most of the time we talk about, well, we need to educate Americans more so they can make more money and keep America productive and, you know, stay off, you know, and take care of themselves and their families, all of which is true. Um, except a big reason Americans have faith in higher education is because we think that higher education makes people better citizens, makes them more tolerant and, and embrace uh, difference, um, enables them to be more competent civic actors. Uh, and um, a consensus emerged in this group that the, 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 a lot of the kind of future of work discussions are focused so much on skills and wages um, that we forget that education is fundamentally about building citizens and, and persons and communities. Uh, so we argue for, you know, yes, we should build this science, but the science should be framed as a civic project. The second one, which I have to confess took me, uh, was humbling in that I've been in this field for two decades and I only just figured it out in July of 2021, is that I, I hope you're all sitting down because this is a revolutionary insight. Um, uh, learning and academic progress are not the same thing, right? I can learn something, right? But not make progress toward a degree. And I can make progress toward a degree without learning anything, right? There's a chronic slippage between those two things, but educational researchers almost never explicitly distinguish those things, right? We almost never say out loud, we can measure learning and we need this kind of science, right? Or we can measure academic progress for which we need this kind of science, right? And learning and academic progress might happen at the same time, but by no means should we assume that they do, right? Um, and that tension, that that fuzziness, I think, has impeded the progress of a great deal of scientific progress because because we haven't we haven't instrumented right um, on the on the phenomenon in a concise way. Um, so that's that's number two, um, and then the third of again the third of nine is that. Um, uh, as researchers, we have to take a life course perspective on education and learning. Um, and I think this is especially important for schools of education that are just so keyed toward young children and young adults, right? Um, we forget that we have to think about education and learning as a, a lifelong project, right? And that's as important when we're talking about early childhood as when we're talking about uh, emerging adults, right? Um, and I'll put another report in the chat in that regard as well. Um, we have to think about the life course and we have to think about life, life, life courses that are gonna be ever longer, right? We have to be thinking about educate, scaffolding education and learning in ways that assume that people are going to live um, you know, 
for for seven, eight, nine decades, right? Um, and this is one of the reasons I'm so pleased that I'm doing this work partly in tandem with Stanford Center on Longevity, um, which I'll also put in the chat. Um, uh, because I think this is one of the ways in which TLA is sort of I, and Stanford are ideally positioned to, to take leadership because we have the capacity across the university to think about teaching and learning um, and educational progress as a truly lifelong uh, endeavor. <laughs>